Yep, sounds good. Okay, let's crack on. So, um, without further ado, episode 61, um, dermatology, the topic of discussion, and the, the one and only Dr. Ivan Bristow. Thanks for your time, sir. Um, no problem. We, Anything for we, an old school friend? <laughs> yep, we will, we, will, we will absolutely bring this up now. Um, we, dermatology, we've only done once before, back in January 2018, episode seven with Belinda. Proved very popular then, so we felt it was about the time to talk all things, uh, all things skin and dermatology again. So, yeah, let's let's just quickly let's get let's cut to the chase and pull up the embarrassing photos. That, I mean, Thanks, just Ian. for back, just for back, just for backstory. <laughs> I, Ivan, um, here, here here we are. This would have been, I would say, Ivan, two thousand and one. Two thousand one, two thousand two. Yeah, two thousand one yeah, to two thousand three. Yeah. So we're going back sort of 18, 18 years or so, I would guess. And uh, that's me in a shirt, a very ill-fitting shirt. I don't know why you're on your knees in front of me, I'll be honest. But um, it's, it's a no. wonderful it's a wonderful head of hair on both of us, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, I was going to say there's definitely more follicles in that shot than there is tonight <laughs> on the two of us. <laughs> uh, so yeah I, Ivan for context Ivan taught me year two of my uh, year, year two year two and three I think it was wasn't it of yep. my bachelor's yep. back in Northampton and then you moved on to um, did you go straight from Northampton to Southampton yep I did from um, north to south and now what, what's the deal now we're going to come on and we're going to plug your blog of course but what, what how are you uh, how are you keeping the lights on nowadays um, well, I've been working effectively, working uh, independently, um, doing a, a range of things. I've still got a couple of sort of visiting appointments with universities, um, which I'm doing. I'm in private practice uh, one and a half days a week, consultancy, writing, blogging, and still lecturing all over the world, really. So it's just, um, you know, just, just keeping very, very busy. Oh, there it is, the dermatology blog. Yeah, just started out as a, literally as a schoolboy project. Um, I started sort of running it in shadow about two, uh, 2016. And uh, basically the blog, uh, yeah, went from there. Perfect. Um, so, oh, you just, are you going to link to the blog? Yeah. I've just seen you yeah. posted a link to the blog. Yep. Yeah, I've just done that now. Yeah. Perfect. I was going to do that. Excellent. So, right. Are we are we done with the embarrassing photos, Craig? Have we got any? Yeah, more? maybe that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the can only we, other can thing. We just, can we just pull up the one of Ivan in front of the the curtain at Northampton, the clinic in Northampton University, oh, okay. where where he looks about eleven and a half years old? Oh, hang on, I'll just give me a I moment. Know. I remember this one. It was from the website on a very dodgy, you know, about a one megapixel camera as it was in the day and. <laughs> the height of technology but yes look at that look at that, look at that. I mean, I, now <laughs> i don't know about, I, I don't know about you ivan but i i, I look back on those days uh, very fondly as, as some of the best of my life but also very very with with significant relief that we did not have any social any social media there was no facebook there was no twitter there was no instagram and there were no camera phones either and i'm delighted no. that most of most of what we all got up to <laughs> is, is is don't no longer it didn't happen that's it. The only thing we got are just the digital images that we occasionally share on media like this, but that is it. Yeah, absolutely. The only other thing we can probably share in is the, the, the J farm most downloaded paper. <laughs> oh God, I don't, I don't want to give him this, but I didn't realize, I didn't realize just, just <laughs> what a champions league uh, publish publisher this guy was. Well, of course I did, but um, yeah, in JFAR, they've got this leaderboard of the most accessed, uh, most accessed articles of all time. And at the top of the list here, just open it up, Craig, so we can see how many uh, use clinical guidelines for the recognition of melanoma of foot and nail unit. 100, and, is that 156,000 6, views? Yeah. Which, which, just to give context, the second in that list um, is, what was it? 28,000. 28, yeah, Twenty-eight thousand. Um, that that's a fairly significant. Um, that's a fairly significant uh, lead, isn't it? Um, mm. And our, our systematic review we did on on uh, pronation nowhere to be seen. So uh, clearly, you picked the sexier specialism, Ivan, um, uh, which you know has served you well. So where should we start, Craig? Uh, is, uh, shall we? 
shall we what i wanted to do is give anyone watching who maybe has a, a fledgling interest in dermatology perhaps they're an un, undergrad or perhaps they're a new grad um i know the questions we get asked a lot is when someone has a, a special interest where where should they go what sort of association should they affiliate with what journal should they read um maybe we could start off and by <clears throat> you giving us a bit of a heads up on uh, I know there's a couple of dermatology associations that are well worth being members of as a podiatrist. I know there's a couple of uh, 2020 is a big year. I think there's two dermatology foot conferences. Can, yeah. we, can, we, can we give people a signpost to some of this stuff, please? Yeah, I mean, the easiest thing is to have a look at the, the blog, my blog, foot.expert, www.foot.expert. But essentially, in the United Kingdom, um, we've got uh, the British Dermatological Nursing Group, the BDNG. That's bdng.org.uk, which as a podiatry group, we merged with them in 2008, 2009 as a special interest group. And they represent us. We, they have an annual conference in June. Um, they run a whole host of courses. The best thing about the BDNG courses is um, they can run a course in dermatology from basic to advanced dermatology. They run them all over the UK at the price of, you ready for this guys, about 20 pounds for the whole day. <laughs> Wow. Now, you can't say better value than that, but uh, they're a very good interest group. The other major player in the United Kingdom, the Primary Care Dermatological Society, the PCDS.org.uk. Um, this was originally a group for GPs, but it's now opened its doors to all, um, all primary care members who are interested in dermatology. And uh, this is a group, as I say, we, we will be organizing a uh, foot dermatology conference with the BDNG, but we're also in the stages of planning, hopefully a big meeting um, later on next year in foot dermatology as well, just because of the interest that we've had and the growing interest, certainly in the United Kingdom. But uh, those are the two largest groups. Um, there's also specialist groups. I mean, there's one, I'm sure, you know, Craig and you would like to join the British Hair and Nail Society. I mean, that sounds pretty specialist, but I could do with some more hair and I could always do with a bit more learning in nails. So uh, they're another group who hold regular meetings. I generally only go to the nail meetings, not the hair meetings, but sometimes they do amalgamate them. But uh, three, three interesting groups. And of course, there's the, the largest, well, the larger group is in the US, the Dermfoot, dermfoot.com, which is the equivalent of the American interest group in dermatology in the foot and every year in April in Washington usually in Washington or in some of the states around they have a fantastic three or four day meeting on um, podiatric dermatology um, they have well over 300 400 speakers um, it's a big old meeting and it's again it's one you know one once if you go once in a lifetime it's worth to have a look to see what the topics very very big interest so there's a lot of it about but uh, we need more globally. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've got an awful, awful lot. Now, let me just... Uh, Craig, did you get all of those so that we can link to them in the... Yeah, no, I'm just typing a few things in now, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Good. Um, when I emailed you to ask you to, to come on here because the email address I had for you was your Southampton University email address. Yep. I, I, yep. I, I, knew, I knew that you'd left. So I, when I emailed you through your, your blog, I, I got added to your, um, to your mailing list, which is great because I don't know much about dermatology. So I'm, I'm not going to unsubscribe. I'm definitely going to stay on that list. But I mean, one of the first emails that came through was, 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 a, was a, I believe it was a course or it was a, certainly a, a, tr a training sort of uh, a day yeah. on dermoscopy. Can we yeah. talk a bit about this? Because everyone I know who's into dermatology and everyone who's talking in these circles seems to be talking about this. So complete idiot's guide, starter point but for, for me, if no one else. Um, what is this and what's its clinical applications and what, what's, what's the deal and, and why, is it, why is it being talked about so much? Okay, this in dermatology is relatively new. It sort of came about in the early 90s just from two or three interested parties who really got involved. But essentially, um, dermoscopy is, as the name suggests, it's, it's using a scope. Well, basically, it's a magnifier with a, um, it's a, magnifier with a, um, a high powered uh, polar cross polarized lens. So essentially, all it does, it magnifies the skin times 10 under intense light. And because it's polarized light, when it's applied to the skin, you can get more detail. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're looking at that, then uh, what you're seeing is much more detail. 
So it's another tool in the box. And the thing about dermatology, it's very visual. So if you can see more, then you can diagnose more. So essentially it's a high powered magnifier specifically for the skin and it's non-invasive. It's very easy to use. The patients like it, you know, it's not causing them any harm. It's big sort of, if you like, raison d'etre is in the recognition of melanoma. And where most of the research initially focused is in the uh, discovery or can, is there a way they can use a dermatoscope to detect melanoma earlier? And as a result of significant research in the last 20 years, the, the answer is that if you use a dermatoscope versus naked eye, uh, you're much more likely to pick up a melanoma. And key to that is pick it up much earlier. So to give an example, whereas you'd have to wait till the melanoma was growing, changing visually to make that diagnosis, by which time it would often be quite advanced with a much thicker lesion, much more poorer prognosis. With a dermatoscope, you may be able to pick up a melanoma when it's two or three millimeters. Now, the good news of that, if you can pick up a melanoma before it started to grow effectively, what we call melanoma in situ, you can remove that lesion and the patient is effectively cured. So what this is helping to do is to recognize and treat melanoma much earlier. And consequently, you know, this has seen an explosion in dermatology, but the research that's followed has also showed that it's not just good for melanoma, it's good for all sorts of tumors. And increasingly, it's fantastic for looking at anything on the foot from a podiatric perspective, from warts, corns, scabies, psoriasis, eczema, and there's lots more research now coming out about the clinical utility. So it's rather like a new investigative tool, if you like, um, that you can learn. You can learn the basics within two to three hours. You can then go on to do intermediate and advanced courses. And by the, by the end of it, what you end up with is something you're carrying around in your pocket. And many dermatologists liken this to... Uh, you know, the cardiologist or the GP has a stethoscope, the dermatologist has a dermatoscope, um, and a dermatoscope really can save lives. And I think that's, that's the key thing, but it's also got many other uses. Wow. So, and what, 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 do, what do they cost if someone's in private practice? Are they, are they encouraged? Are you, should private practitioners have one of these in their clinic? You know, uh, you know we, we would never have yeah. a private practice without a Doppler, without a monofilament. Should they have a dermatoscope as part of their, in their toolbox? If they're, if they're looking at skin, which most of them are, I mean, it has great utility. What does it cost? Now, key thing here is like most things, you know, it's like saying, I want to buy a car. There are good cars and there are not so good cars. When it comes to dermoscopy, to be honest with you, there is a lot of substandard uh, dermatoscopes sold out there with not the correct settings, not the... Um, the sort of power what you're really looking to spend is it's a one-off because you only buy them once probably something about eight nine hundred pounds i don't know craig roughly the what's in, in aussie dollars that's double is it double and a bit yeah 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 so um it's it's a one-off investment they don't wear out the only thing you might have to change your rechargeable battery but you know it's also a tax write-off but what it can do for you is so much more in terms of skin assessment so looking at skin lesions looking at nails looking at pigment in nails looking at pigment in skin it's a great tool and as i say it's something that i will carry around with me the other key thing of course is that they all attach to smartphones and cameras so you can record much more of what you see in fine detail so you can monitor patients much more easily um, you can keep a check on things patients like it they can see they can visualize what the image is they can see it all so it it's it's good all round. and i think a bit like a stethoscope when you're looking at, when you're assessing a patient you're using a damascope it gives you that quiet time to pause and think I don't know what the equivalent is in your field, Ian, you know, something for you to do some quiet reflection while the patient <laughs> is in the chair, but the damascope certainly allows that. Yeah. Yeah. We all need that quiet reflection time. Oh, just while it's come up before it disappears off my screen, we've had a question from Alana. Is there any recommended text? People still, people still favor having a book. I know. I mean, mm. now's the time to, to mention the book, your, your, your textbook podiatric dermatology atlas you and rodney yeah Dorber. it's rodney now. well to be honest with you the problem is it's it's desperately out of date and with things like demoscopy and so many new treatments uh, coming online it is a little bit out of date and if you look for it second hand i looked on uh, 
there was somebody on eBay selling it for about three hundred pounds. Which you know, if only I was still taking royalties, I'd be a very happy man. But <laughs> in the moment, you know, general dermatology textbooks seem to be the best way to start. Just the relatively cheaper ones. Um, you'll find lots. There it is. How much is that set? 190. Oh, sorry. Hardcover. Yeah, paperback from 60. Uh, so, you know, I've got, I've got a hardcover copy of this on my shelf. Um, hasn't been opened for, for some time. And it's good to know, it's good to know its value in case, you know, times ever get hard. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Don't, you don't want to sell your hearsts so you can sell your yeah. textbook of podiatry yeah. dermatology. I know. You got it. You got it. You got it. <laughs> um, how about how about journals? What journals perhaps away from podiatry that podiatrists yeah. may not be aware of? What journals should people be mindful of and sort of dipping into if they can? Um, there are a lot more open access journals available now and they're always key, but many of the key dermatology journals the British Journal of Dermatology, the European association of dermatology there are a lot of journals which have frequently have open access papers um a, a lot of it is still closed i suppose one of my best recommendations one of the best resources online actually comes from craig will be pleased to hear this from new zealand um which is dermnet yeah.nz which is a fantastic online if you like encyclopedia very well written very easy to understand and it's one of those places, if you're in clinic and you have a smartphone and internet access, you can have a quick peek, go online, and the information is there, concise, accurate, and up-to-date with some good clinical photos. And in terms of that website, it's far better than a, any, any book at the moment. And uh, it has got a lot of good detail. There we are. Yeah, as you can see there, and lots and lots of different pieces but just the if you type in the name of a disorder it will come up and give you all the information the clinically relevant information the other the other online resource i would also recommend is going back to what i mentioned earlier the pcds.org.uk they have an online uh, dermatology atlas and encyclopedia and uh, again there is a lot of good information for free available on that um you know, the new media of web is easily updated and I'd mm -hmm. probably spend more time looking on the web than I do in books these days just because the information is out there in these open access journals and on these websites. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of good stuff out there. And that's, that's a good thing. Well, yeah, I think the word the open access is the word that we all want to hear, isn't it? Because it reduces the barrier to, to, to be able to read it in the first place. So that's good. Um, we'll, we'll post links to all of those as well. There was just a comment that came up and um, I'm going to try and I'm going to try and say what this is. I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm sure it's from Fiona. And I, I, I suspect this is secondary to the use of a, uh, of, a of a dermoscope given that yeah. that was about the time that was about the time it came in. But she said, hi, we, we have had three cases of longitudinal uh, melancholy. Melanichia, thank you. I've, Melanichia, um, not melancholy. No, 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 you're not melancholic. Uh, <laughs> I, Melanichia, I'm a, I'm yes. A bit, I'm a bit. Um, they referred to dermatology. Two cases came back, not a problem. Third, dermato term, dermatologists couldn't call either way, did biopsies. How do we know when to refer so we don't waste the dermatologist yeah. time or, or NHS time? Okay. And, and could you, before you answer that, could you also let mm. me and people like me know what longitudinal melanichia okay. is? Okay. Uh, melanichia is basically, if you translate the term, is the presence of melanin in the nail. Um, but particularly what melanichia is often called longitudinal melanichia. So what we're talking about are longitudinal brown stripes within the nail. And when you see these, people are always sort of a bit fearful because in the back of their mind that longitudinal melanichia, one of the diagnoses, although it is the rarer diagnosis, is subungual melanoma. And subungual melanoma is is rare compared to cutaneous melanoma as a podiatrist you're much more likely to see a cutaneous one on the skin rather than the one in the nail now the difficulty is it's it's difficult to visualize demoscopy can help but there are some basic sort of key pointers i can give you on that what you're looking at where where should there be red flags when should you be concerned this is something a referral what you're looking for is um a longitudinal brown stripe emerging from the proximal nail fold all the way through the nail okay so it's got to go from the base to the top in a stripe like fashion and particularly worrying if it's in a usually a fairer skinned individual in a single nail 
The first thing to say is in the darker skin types, so uh, types three, four, and five, uh, particularly in Asian populations, multiple brown stripes in the nails are actually quite normal and part of the aging process. But if you see a single nail affected by a brown stripe, then that certainly needs more investigation. The sort of red flags within that are uh, longitudinal melanichia. Have a look, just like on the skin, how many colors can you see in that brown stripe? Can you see more than two colors? Is it what we call variegated? Can you see thick and thin lines, irregular gaps, or is it all one color? The other key thing, is it changing? Now, generally, if it's a melanoma in the base of the nail, what you'll see is it'll widen. So the line and the band will get wider. And as the nail grows up, obviously the new nail added will have more pregnant at the base. So if the line looks slightly triangular, that is a sign that the uh, nail, you know, that it, there is something in there that needs to be biopsied. The other thing to look for is also to have a look at the tip of the nail. Oh, thank you, Craig. Very handy. Have a look at the tip of the nail. And uh, now if I can just, uh, just where you've got your mouse at the moment, Craig, go to your left, to your left, sorry. That thing, you know, you notice the nail is eroding. There's, there's a groove in the nail. Change in the nail, particularly at the tip of the nail. Um, if you get uh, the nail disintegrating, as you can see on the right image there, the nail disintegrating is also um, a concerning sign. So those are the typical red flags. The key thing though is to remember is change. And these things will change over time. So if you're not sure if it's a hematoma or just a bruise, bruises under the nail, hematomas grow out. Melanichia will stay there and just continue to grow. So monitoring the patient over a few weeks, a month, this is where taking a photo with a damascope can be really helpful because you can chart that change and compare photos, you know, month to month and then refer patients. But if there's any doubt, as I say, it's always to air caution and get the patient referred for a, uh, a rapid assessment appointment. Perfect. Thank you. Hopefully Fiona is still online with us and uh, that answered her question suitably. My screen's just frozen, Craig. Any other questions coming in? I no, meant there's no very, others. I meant, I meant to say to the, everyone watching at the start, please do fire your, your, your sensible and smart dermatology questions at Ivan, because I probably don't have sensible or, or, or smart ones. Um, <laughs> so so uh, please feel free to t take the lead as the audience on, on, that, on, uh, on where this discussion goes. Uh, let me just unfreeze my computer and see what was next on my list to talk about. Um, Shall we have a short commercial break? <laughs> Oh yes, oh, Ivan, you you'll be so proud of me. You, you you'll be proud of me. We're, we're now Craig and I are apparently now influencers. Craig, take go ahead. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, we, we we've actually got a giveaway. Um, we've got some product donated. Let me just share my screen. I'll share this link. What you need to do? Let me just post the link. Is you need to go to this link and do one or more of the following things: subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter. Oh, hang on, I haven't shared it. Sorry, let me just finish the share. There we go. So what you need to do, I'll post this link in a moment, is you need to go to this link and subscribe to our YouTube channel and or follow us on Twitter and or like us on Facebook and or follow us on Instagram and or like the Ego um, Facebook page. So you get two entries for that and one entry for all of those and you'll go into a drawer for a two pairs of the ego results that Ian and I have both tried out. So I'll post that link. It, the competition runs till about the middle of next week. I'm just posting the link there now. So um, please enter the into the competition. Do one or more or all of those things to get as many entries as you like into this into this draw. So back to our regular scheduled yeah. program. <laughs> and we, should, we should just, Craig, we should just tell people what ego are, because I'd never heard of them in the UK. Okay, no, no. And I know, I know in Australia, there's the, 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 their competitor, if people are really familiar with Archies, but you can probably see there, they're, they're essentially a bit like a, well, they're a flip-flop, but they've actually got a bit of shape to them. With a, with a, um, and a rear and foot a, post. Oh, they've got a rear foot post as well, have they? Four degrees. Oh, <laughs> for the, of course, of course, for always for always for. Um, so yeah, the company were kind enough to send Craig and I a pair. Uh, we said we would give them a shout out, and they said if you do a giveaway, then we'll give some of your listeners some free pairs as well. So yeah, we we are reveling in our position as influencers now. Um, it's absolutely one hundred percent gone to our heads. And any other company that wants to um, 
that wants to do something similar, we'll, we'll always give you a shout out if you just give us some free stuff. That's all we're about. We just want some free stuff. Um, Ivan, what, what, what can, what can mm. the dermatology world, uh, what can the dermatology world offer us for free? Well, you know, what, what's the cool thing? Uh, clearly not, not dermoscopes, but what would you suggest um, is out there That's that, a that we want? I've got a, I've actually got a, a tube of generic uh, antifungal cream for anybody <laughs> like that. That's, the, that's always available. <laughs> always useful. Yeah. Or a uh, 10, 20 percent urea cream. I mean, in as I as I say, I'm just uh, working on a, a something at the moment. Emollients are always very, very popular in in private practice, and every every practice who deals with patients who've got dry skin should should have them because they're yeah. something they're good for business they're good for patients and they're good for as a basic treatment for many many skin disorders um and and you know everybody should have them i use them my hands are so soft that's why it's not because i do the washing up it's because i regularly use an ammonia well you know you've 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 beautifully sort of uh teed up another question here which uh which is good because i was thinking of what i wanted to ask you so let's mm. let's talk about emollients because we we briefly touched on this all the way back in episode seven which i don't i don't su suspect people will recall but i remember talking at the time about um aqueous cream was was historically yep. a very popular emollient because of its yep. um I, I think because of its price point but uh, the suggestion Definitely. was it should, in, it should instead be used as a soap substitute rather than a, a direct yeah. moisturizer. At least that was yeah. the message that I recall Belinda telling us. And then we were talking about the favored, favored kind of creams for the feet. I believe Epiderm, if, I, if memory serves, came up. What, what's new in the world of emollients? What's, what's, the, what's the market leader and, and is it with good reason? I mean, if you're talking about hands and feet, then urea-based products still uh, is, you know, urea is basically the discerning ingredient that you're using particularly for hands and feet. Um, the science is there in the sense of urea has many, many natural properties, um, not least because it's a very good moisturizer. It's a humectant. It holds moisture in the skin. But the other effects that other products don't have so much are things like the ability to stimulate the skin to produce more of its natural moisturizing factors. So by using a urea-based cream, you know, a regular 10% cream, for example, on a daily basis, what you're doing, not only are you keeping more moisture in the skin, you're stimulating the skin to produce its own moisture. There's upregulation, as we call it, of natural moisturizing factors. The other unusual thing is, a lot, not a lot of people know this, but your skin naturally produces uh, its own antibiotics, if you like. These are called antimicrobial peptides. Um, they've only been discovered in the last 20 years or so. But we know as part of the natural secretions through the sweat, um, there are these, these very short chain amino acids which uh, have an effect on bacteria, virus and fungi. And when you use something like urea in the skin, there are urea receptors. It's part of the natural moisturizing factors. It upregulates production of uh, antimicrobial peptides. So in essence, what you're doing is improving the skin's barrier and protecting against things like fungal infections, protecting against the bacterial infections. But to put it simply, if your skin is well hydrated and well moisturized, you're much less likely to succumb to um, things like athlete's foot and uh, virus because it has to find a way into the skin. And if the skin is intact and well cared for, that job's a lot more difficult. So yeah. everybody out there, just moisturize, stay soft. Yeah, stay soft. Uh, yeah, let's move on sharpish. From that one. <laughs> the, I don't know if you remember this discussion we had when I was in my third year, but uh, you said to me, you said to me, um, you'll never make you, a good you, student, Griffiths. No, not that yeah. one. No, not that one. Yeah. No, okay. I mean, yeah, multiple times. Uh, you, you said to me, you said to me, right, uh, uh, what, what you should do, you need to set yourself a goal to have something published within 12 months of qualifying. Do you remember saying this to me? And you said, yep. it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what yep. it is. It doesn't matter where it is. And we've got to give this yep. context to the, to the young ones listening. There was no such thing as blogs mm. back then, you know, no. so it wasn't like you, you didn't have the opportunity to publish a blog or write a Facebook post. If you wanted to write something and put yourself out there, you had to actually go old fashioned and submit it yep. somewhere. And you said, I don't, it doesn't matter where it is or what it's on, but you need to, you need to submit something. And, um, and uh, I don't think I've ever thanked you for that because you were probably one of the people that gave me my, my, my hunger for publishing. But when I said, okay, well, what shall I publish on? You said, make it, just make it simple, make it applicable. And I remember you saying, 
you know, the, the most common thing that people see on the foot and the, they mistake is they, they see that dry, dusty appearance that they say, oh, this is anhydrosis. This is dry yep. skin. Uh, and you said it probably isn't. It's probably uh, trichophyton rubrum. And again, yep. even as someone who d- d- knows nothing about dermatology, I still I still remember this. And I, 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 mem- I mentioned it back in episode seven as well. Um, can we can we talk a bit? Is there is there much more to say about that? Can we just give people a bit of context? Because that as a non dermatology yeah. sort of person, that really really stuck with me. And even now, when I see someone for their plantar fascia or their mm. plantar plantar plate, I'll still glance at their foot, and I may not say it out loud, yeah. but I look and go, "This is fungal." I, I, it's just stuck with me for for nineteen twenty years. Can you just um, talk through yeah, sure. that for everyone else? I mean, this is the thing, what, what you've got to do, I mean, it's, dermatology is great because you could be the visual detective and this is what lit my fire literally in the second year when I was at college as a student myself in Northampton, spotting a melanoma, but actually seeing things and making a difference is important. But if you want an easy goal, and that's something that is, and that's probably why I mentioned it to you, Ian, that athlete's foot is, is very, very common. If you consider that fungal skin infection is... Uh, if you look at the number of days lost through disability in the, the annual global census of the most common things in the world today, fungal skin infection is about number three or four. And of that subset, tinea pedis is the most common. So you're looking at probably one of the most common diseases in the world. And studies have shown that a third of all the patients walking into your clinic statistically will have fungus on their feet. So it's out there it's undiagnosed and it's untreated the good news is it's easy to diagnose you're looking for that dry dusty appearance on the sole of the foot have a look between the toes if it's macerated as well that's probably a very good sign if they've got changes in the nails as well bigger bonus but essentially it's so easy to treat all you need is an antifungal Uh, patient needs to use that for four weeks and you'll clear that and suddenly the skin will reverse in age by about 20 years because it just reverts back without the fungal infection. Um, I mean, the key thing here, and this, this, this goes for sports too, because how often uh, you two see sports, you know, you must see a lot of tinea pedis in your sports clinics. How often do you ask about your male runner's groins, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, exclusively, usually. I know. I, <laughs> there you I remember, are. Yeah, yeah. I remember you standing in a lecture at the front at university with one of your hilarious gags saying, you know, we get an incredible amount of tinea in the feet, we get an incredible mm. amount of tinea in the groin, and we just can't work out how it gets from one to the other. And you, as you said this, you were scratching yourself. Do you remember this? You said, I'm you were always standing scratching. There saying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a risk of being in dermatology. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, just yes, while, no, just no, while no, we're no, on no. tinea, guys, there's, there's a question coming from Heather. Um, what is the best antifungal cream? The one the patient uses. Um, mm-hmm. The best one in terms of speed, um, if you're treating a, a regular athlete's foot, tobinafin is the fastest acting, mm. but it's slightly, more expect, it's slightly more expensive than, say, clotrimazole, myconazole. But what you've got to understand... Um, they've been tested head to head at a four week duration because generally speaking, if a patient comes in with athlete's foot, they haven't just got it yesterday. They've had it for years. So I will say to patients to use it for a minimum of four weeks over four weeks. If you compare all the leading um, antifungals, there is not much difference. Myconazole is equally as effective as clotrimazole is equally effective as tobinafin. Uh, the difference is tobinafin will cure in half the time but there is a little bit of a price premium. So if you can buy it generically as tobinafin as opposed to a brand, it's cheaper. Um, but technically, at four weeks, which is really how you should be prescribing it, say to the patients they should be treating at least four to six weeks if they're heavily infected, um, that uh, any of those, an uh, azole or tobinafin is probably uh, top of the pile there. And going back to groins, Ian, sorry, I, I just got to go back there. You're Please do. quite yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, do, do. What people don't realize is, of course, you, well, most people do realize, but don't think about it. You have to put your underwear over your feet, don't you, to get them on. I've not found any other way. I can't put them over my head yet. I've not worked out a routine. But that is the way that fungal spores are spread. And bear in mind that of your particularly males, because it's more of a male issue, we could have a debate as to why that is, but we won't go there now. Um, <laughs> You, you roughly about a quarter of your male tinea 
PDIS patients will have regular tinea pruris and they will have no idea that it's associated with the infection on their feet. Once you say to them, do you ever get, you know, irritation around the groin on and off? And then you explain that actually to do with your feet, the compliance and the treatment of athletes for and the tinea cruise is so much better. They go with the flow and, you know, they're treating it all. And of course, these antifungal creams can be used downstairs and upstairs just as equally effectively. What, in the house you mean? Or... Oh, no, <laughs> not no, quite. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk. Can we just, uh, can I ask a question about fungal mm. spores? Because uh, I've got this vague thing in my mind and I was either told it or I've, or I've, I, I've sort of misremembered it, but I, I seem to recall this scenario where fungal spores, uh, you know, they they won't, they, they, they won't last the sort of hot in your socks through a 40 degree wash, but mm. they'll hang around, they'll hang around in shoes for, for months and months and months. And I seem to remember this old wives tale of this, person who put on an old pair of shoes and reinfected themselves and um, which yeah. is why we say you know treat the shoes and the what's the science here do spores hang around and how long for? spores yeah spores i mean it's not so much the spores sometimes it's what we could it's a sort of fungal fomo so we all shed our skin and of course we shed our skin our our footwear as we shed our skin around the house as dust so there's always skin in the shoes which is a, a food source for fungus so whether it's as a spore as or as act, active growing dermatophytes it can quite happily live on a squame of skin for six eight months so it's got a, a great longevity the question is how do you kill it um there have been lots of studies and there's a paper i uh, um, was going to discuss this on my blog in a future blog but how do you decontaminate shoes and socks and it's a little bit of a tricky business um lots of things have been tried lots of old wives tales suggested um, at the moment, there's sort of debate going on about what, what we can use. Uh, Tobinifin spray in um, studies has been shown to be useful for that. So spraying the shoes mm. with the 1% spray has more effect than, say, using uh, a regular sort of detergent, if you like, and sort of dabbing that around the shoe. Chlorhexidine is probably not the best thing to put in the shoe for a number of reasons. It stains, it's sticky, it's alcohol-based. Um, it has a whole range of issues with that. Um, quite recently in the UK, um, we've seen a new product on the market, which is based on hypochlorous acid. Now, hypochlorous acid is an interesting substance for many reasons, but one thing that it can inactivate is fungus, and um, that's much cheaper than Lamisil spray hypochlorous acid, and is available in various preparations, and it appears to have some good um, effects on hard surfaces, shoes and fabrics, but more work is needed than that. But certainly that may, away, may be a way forward. But the key thing to remember is fungus always comes back. If you've had it once, there's a 90% chance that you're going to get it again within, within months. Um, and a lot of the time we don't spend enough time with our patients to advise this to them because you do all this wonderful work, you clear their nails, you clear their feet, and then it comes back within a year. And that's because in their mind, you know, that you didn't do a good job. What you've got to do is tell them what measures they need to take to stop it coming back. The key thing is keep it off the skin. If the foot is clear and they're regularly using an antifungal, something like tobinifin one week in four, um, as a prophylactic and studies have shown its prophylactic value, uh, it's a good way to keep the foot, you know, literally keeping the fungal populations down so it doesn't lead to recurrent um, uh, onychomycosis, maybe even tinea cruris. Haven't studied that far up yet. Yeah. So, uh, that, so that's, a, that's quite a take home there. If, if you've had a mm. fungal foot infect, fungal skin infection on the foot before, yep. it, it's sensible to use t something like tobinafin one yep. week in four to prevent yep. a future episode. Okay, I yeah. see I was not aware of that. That's good stuff. Okay, perfect. Sorry, Craig, go on. Yeah, look, I just got an orthotic question um, for you, um, Ivan. Um, pour on, which we obviously mm. use a lot in top covers, is open cell. So Simon, has, yeah. Simon Dickinson's asked is, can spores live in the pour on, in the open cell? <laughs> nice question, Dicko, nice question. Mm. Uh, I would guess so. I mean, if they're in shoes, they're being trodden on. I mean, anywhere where feet are going to be, they're going to be shedding squames. So quite possibly, yes, actually in the pour on. I think there's a study there, maybe even a PhD, but mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say it's not, you know, I wouldn't say uh, it's not possible. I'm sure it's quite possible in that respect. I always wonder about airport mats, you see, you know, when you get 
pulled over at the airport if you do all this air travel <laughs> they pull you out on this mat and then they get you to take your shoes off and you think how many other people have stood on this mat and they never clean it <laughs> that's just a massive dematified exchange program going on there on a global scale <laughs> yeah. um, so we just had um, an earlier question we t- from alana about do, do woods lamps still have a place uh rarely um if you if you have again this is something i've written at length on my blog there are uses for wood lamp woods lamps they're not useful for the most common dermatophyte infections um they are useful for erythrasma now that's a whole other area we could go on for an hour but interdigital areas are a haven for microbes and infections and uh, commensals and all sorts but where they are good for is looking in between the toes for erythrasma, which is a, an overgrowth of bacteria and fungi, if you like, having a party, which can potentially lead to fissures and consequently lead to things like cellulitis and foot infection. So it's a portal of entry. Um, the good thing about woods lights is that you can get them very cheap on Amazon. Uh, you necessarily won't search them under woods lights. Uh, they're actually sold, mo- I think most of them are sold as cat urine detectors. Now, you may laugh at that, but they're little torches, they're UV torches that you buy to see where your cat's been weeing in your house or spraying up the furniture because uh, a bit like erythrasma, cat urine fluoresces under woods light. So the good news is you can buy these for about five or ten pounds on Amazon and you can use them in clinic, not for looking for cat wee, but for actually looking for erythrasma, which is a, um, a mixed bacterial infection you find in between the toes, which shines this beautiful coral pink color. But for regular dermatophytes, it's it's not going to have much value. Sure, I've I've just posted a link to your blog post on the on the chat. Thanks. So, mm-hmm. Thanks. Uh, so I recall you walking around at university with with a woods light in your in your lab coat pocket. So twenty. <laughs> There's a joke you know, in there are. somewhere. Yeah. 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 <laughs> probably looking for cat urine uh, 2019 <laughs> here we are when you're you know you're in clinic now what's in your what's in the pocket of your white coat do you still have a woods light you obviously have a dermatoscope i'm going to make that assumption is there anything else in in your about your person in your clinic that, that you need to, to to comfortably do that clinic no you just need your eyes and you need you know it's observation so the dermatoscope is key and listening to patients and a good history and just using your, your senses four out of the five i'd always suggest you know sense of taste is probably not not, <laughs> not worth investigating uh, but super. good observational skills is key and recognizing patterns dermatology is all about recognizing patterns presentations um it's a bit like bird watching if you're into bird watching you'll probably be you're probably good in in dermatology because bird watching is all about recognizing what type of bird is it by the way it moves by the color by the way it flies and so on and there was an old story that most dermatologists were bird watchers years ago i don't think there are so many bird watchers these days but um dermatoscope i would say is definitely good and a good internet link to an online manual like the dermnet um, nz website just if you need that quick reference but um Perfect. and keeping updated that's key yep Sounds good. So no quick fixes. Um, five minute fungus. I've got to be honest. Mm. I, I, I don't know much about this. I've just seen people on the various fora uh, on, yep. the, on the internet sort of talking about it and, and saying, saying they use it, saying they don't use it, saying they love it, saying they don't love it. Mm. Can, you, um, can you just give us a bit of a summary of your, your take on it? Okay. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I have to declare a, an interest in that, you know, I was the first person to sort of bring this into UK. So I'm, I'm not going to you know hide from that. And obviously, I'm, I use it extensively. Um, it's really because I was totally frustrated by the poor results you got from mycology labs from hospitals. When you send off a clipping of the nail, how often do you send it off? It takes four weeks, and if they don't lose it, it always comes back negative. And mm. statistics show roughly 30% of um, these mycology samples that come back from labs uh, will be uh, false negatives. You know it's fungus, you're sure it's fungus. But the technology behind it is very simple. It's very similar to a pregnancy test, although you're testing for something slightly different. Uh, but it's antibodies within a strip which are sensitive to uh, dermatophyte proteins. So if you take a sample of nail, you put it in a test tube with a bit of buffer solution and stir it round and then put the strip in, what it does using immunochromatography, it passes the, the fluid over the antibody field. And if there's more than one microgram of dermatophyte protein, then it triggers a color change in the paper. So 
What does it do? It's not going to tell you the species of dermatophyte, but it will tell you if dermatophyte is present. Um, it's reliability that's been published in studies in the British Journal of Dermatology and the Journal of Dermatology have shown it to be uh, very, very accurate. But the key thing is in five minutes, you can have a result. So there's no waiting around. And if a patient's in the chair, well, have I got, you know, is that, uh, is that a fungal infection in my nails? You can give an answer in five minutes. I mean, it is, it is a little bit more expensive than looking, but to be honest, if you're gonna do any active treatment, you really need to diagnose it first. Um, and using whatever diagnostic test would use a five minute fungus or a lab test, you always need to establish a diagnosis before you treat to ensure that you're actually treating what the patient's got because about 50% of uh, abnormal nails are fungal, which means 50% are not. And by looking alone, uh, studies have shown you can only be about 60% accurate on visual analysis. And that studies amongst dermatologists and podiatrists that have shown that just by giving them a picture and saying, is this fungal or not, that they'll get it right at best about six times out of 10, which means 40% of the time, even by looking, we get it wrong, which if they're going to have something like, like, I don't know, whatever treatment people are using, it's important to get that diagnosis. All the guidelines state, if you're going to treat onychomycosis, it's important to get the diagnosis to make sure they've actually got what you're going to treat. And don't forget, you know, one of the main reasons people say, oh, this treatment for my fungal nail hasn't worked is if you haven't tested to see if it's fungal, how do you know you're actually treating a fungal nail? It might just be a thickened nail. So, you know, it's, it's important to establish a diagnosis. Yeah, I know here in Australia, Ivan, you, you can't get oral tibidifine without a positive culture. Yeah. And if there's a 30% false negative, it's extremely frustrating. You know, like clinically, when it's bleeding obvious, it's bleeding obvious, mm. <laughs> you know, and it comes back negative. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it is frustrating. And, uh, that, that's the reason we need, you know, the technology is out there. Yeah. It just, we need to update and we can't yeah. go on just looking and guessing. Uh, particularly now many of us are prescribers, uh, we're using different drugs. We just have to be ethical and do it the best, the best that we can. Yeah. Uh, another question came in, Ivan, from hmm. Graham. Um, again, apologies in advance if my pronunciation is a, a wee bit off. Um, this is embarrassing, this episode for me. Any place for ni nicotinamide-based products, uh, open brackets, uh, ADEX, ADEX, uh, yep. close brackets, uh, yep. in, podiatry, in podiatry yet, sometimes used in eczema-based treatments? Yeah, I mean, this, this is relatively new on the market, but it's, it's a spin on emollients. And uh, the management of itch is often, you know, as you can imagine, in things like eczema and psoriasis is a very big market. And one of the sort of leading consumer concerns is what can I do to reduce itching and inflammation? And yeah, additives like this, nicotinamide has been shown to reduce itching and have other effects uh, physiologically. I don't think it's quite filtered into the podiatry market yet. Um, most itchy feet, I would say that we see are usually fungal. Um, and it's about treating the source, but generally speaking, I would say it's, it's new on the market. Give it time. It may find applications within that. Um, I have got a few samples that my local rep dropped off, but I must admit, I haven't tried them yet. So, uh, yeah. Maybe in a few years' time. It's, Maybe in a few it's, a, time. it's just vitamin B, one of the vitamin Bs, isn't it? Um, oh, now you're testing my chemistry. I'm going um, to go it, to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was cigarette. Well, no. <laughs> oh, it, I'm sure, you know, I could be completely wrong. And looking at, yeah, looking I know, vitamin B3. B B3, there we are. Yeah. There's too many of them. Um, it's, yeah, it's about controlling the itch, I believe. And, it's evidence to date. There's been some evidence from the original work, but I haven't seen much more since that. Um, I know it's been included in a couple of emollient reviews, um, but I haven't heard much more about it from there. Mm. So it may, it may have a place, but um, give it time. Perfect. Craig, any more? I'm just looking at the time. We're coming up to the hour. Yeah. Um, any more questions that have come in on the Facebook? Uh, no, I think that's all comments. just a... Few, I've got few. one. I've got one more. If 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 I can dive in, if no one yeah, else. No, has got yeah, one. no, there's no no more that I can see. <laughs> Good, great. Um, Ivan, this is um, just to get your take on something. Really, it's um, 
when we, we, we when we in our musculoskeletal clinics we'll often tape people up as like a treatment we call it a treatment direction test so someone has patellofemoral pain or someone has uh plantar heel pain and we'll often use kind of zinc oxide fairly rigid mm. zinc oxide tape um and we'll say to them right you're going to keep this on for three days and if over those three days there's a significant modification of your pain it raises our suspicion you may be a better candidate for a, for a, something in your shoe some sort of orthosis now i yeah. don't know why but we always seem to say three days keep it on for three days and after three days even if you love it you've got to take it off and and it's sort of just mm, bled into my sort of patter when I talk to people I just sort of say to people look take it off after three days the the human skin really doesn't like being occluded for uh, for that much longer what um have we got any real data we can lean on here how how long can we occlude skin for tape wise and 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 um is are we about right with three days yeah I mean if it's, it's zinc oxide is for most people, it's pretty inert, but there'll, there'll always be a subset of the population. It's not so much the zinc oxide that people can be sensitive to. It's actually something called colophony, and the zinc oxide is added to reduce the um, the effects of the colophony quite often in the in the tape. I mean, how much occlusion is bad occlusion? It, it really depends on the extent of the moisture collecting. Now, if you're using it, I suspect you say on the legs and stuff like that, they're not naturally highly sweaty areas. Um, I think you're you're pretty safe within that range unless it's really really occlusive. There will be some evaporation through zinc oxide. Um, I I don't think there's a major risk. The only thing is if someone is sensitive to it or in the rare cases of allergy, um, that might be a problem. But usually patients will know if they're allergic to it. You know they'll tell you oh zinc oxide is a is a common one, um, and patients will alert you to that. But yeah, you're probably okay in that ballpark as long as they're not too sweaty or the plaster's not too occlusive. Are you you're yeah. wearing it right now, Ian, or is it just the way you sat there? You... I'm wearing it on my groin, on my groin, but that, that's... that's <laughs> yeah. um, no yeah, wonder you've yeah. got that tinea cruris, I know. <laughs> uh, Craig, we are at the hour. If there's yeah. no other questions, uh, which I can't see any on my Facebook page down in front of me here, uh, I'm just checking I haven't missed any. No, I think um, that, that's all, yeah so uh, ivan is there anything we always like to, you've been kind enough to give us an hour of your time which mm. we do massively we massively appreciate um is there anything you need to plug i know we've plugged your blog a little bit and things but, you know feel, you know uh, we're influencers now so you know leverage our audience by all means is there any courses you've got coming at your, your, your delivery well i mean there's lots of courses not all mine but i would just say uh, the events page on my blog gives you a list of all the courses, everything I've mentioned there, all the groups they're mentioned on the blog site. I mean, it's just the sort of freedom of information portal for anything dermatological because quite honestly, you know, we need more people in dermatology because it's a, it's a big area. Um, there's lots going on and you can really make a difference. And I think the thing about dermatology is that most people are secretly interested in it. Um, at some stage and it's just growing that interest i mean there, there are lots of you great guys in the world of biomechanics but let's let's you know let's promote dermatology skin is the thing and we've all got it and i think as podiatrists we can make a big difference and you know everything we look at is on the skin when a patient comes in from shaking their hand to assessing their foot it's all dermatology of one sort or another so uh keep curious keep looking and uh yeah keep up keep the cpd going in dermatology but by all means, use the website and uh, yeah, keep up to date. Perfect. All right. Brilliant. All right. Look, th thank, thanks so much, Ivan. Thanks, Ian. We've had a lot of people join in the last 10 minutes, so we've been going for an hour. So if you come back to Facebook in about 10, 15 minutes, they'll render the video. It'll be there. I'll get it up on YouTube later today and the, the, the podcast version will be available later today as well. So thanks a lot, Ivan. And thanks, thank Ian. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Ian.